The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend. Radio team for the next 60 minutes will take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now let's fire up the news hour. Here is the weekend radio team. I think I was gonna be able to get up this now. <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Very high chew, and uh, this is Mike McAuliffe. Hi there. Usual hosts, and today we have a very, very special guest. Miss. Hello. Hi there. Our guest is uh, S. Rowan Wilson, uh, who was the plaintiff in a uh, case that was filed in 2011 and was recently uh, heard and decided upon at the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. And uh, I see. How you doing today, Rowan? Oh, your volume is much better. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. <laughs> Good. How are you? I, I, I'm well uh, also. And um, Rowan and I have known each other for a few years now. We, uh, we were both involved with the uh, Libertarian Party of Nevada at one point, and um, uh, we have since moved on to, uh, to other endeavors and other causes. Um, but I, I do recall uh, you talking about this, uh, that what you planned to do at that time, uh, and I have seen, I, I've read different news stories on this. I uh, went onto the Cannabis website, read their news story about it, and saw the comments. And some of these people were saying, oh, what a fool this person was. Why would she tell a, a gun dealer that she had a medical marijuana card? And, um, you know, I recall you were saying that, that you had planned to do this, uh, to, uh, to push this issue, because you wanted to prove that this, that this restriction and this issue is not about pot at all uh, and that it's uh, more about uh, personal health uh, safety and liberty um, so take us back to uh, when when this first started please thank you first I'd like to clarify that bless their little hearts all the different narratives and how few people few supposedly journalists few writers authors have contacted me. One would think that verifying a source would be primary these days, wouldn't one? Well, not in today's news cycle, <laughs> it seems. <laughs> so there have been all kinds of things made up, said what have you. But this started with, I was lobbying at the Capitol. At the time, I was doing my pre-med requirements to attend osteopathic medical school, which I ultimately chose not to attend and bumped into the ACLU in Nevada. And several of us were lobbying, because for those who are not from Nevada, or have had medical cards in the state of Nevada, the law was in place for over 10 years without any provisions for patients to obtain medicine. How silly is that? Very. So that's where some of our conversation started, to put it in full context, okay? Move on to meeting various different people at the Capitol lobbying on behalf of patients and I would show up in my medical scrubs. I was working, putting myself through you know, the rest of the uh, pre-med studies at the time and you know, was also working as a med tech at the nursing home or as I prefer to call the drug dealer at the nursing home because mm -hmm. really those are the real drugs, right? With the third largest killer in the United States right now being prescription drugs and medical error. Let's, let's at least get out of the way that those are the real, real drugs, right? Absolutely. Uh, with the opioid epidemic out of hand, we're all familiar with what's happening with EpiPen, the cost spiraling out of control, yada, 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 yada. So, started talking with a group. How do we change things? My initial concern was, uh, why is it anybody's business, and isn't it a violation of HIPAA law what, to ask what I'm doing to my body or what I'm not doing to my body? You know, we could have incredible fines and fees as just a med tech at a nursing home to give out information to an unauthorized family member or anybody even standing around staring at the screen behind us without a screen protector who would even see oh, the address, let alone what meds that patient's on, right? Mm -hmm. 
So how in the world could, as we found out later, the um, <laughs> alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, you know, ATF, which mm-hmm. really sounds more like, you know, three acronym convenience store than... But it is a federal who, bureaucracy. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The federal bureaucracy. Yes. Bless their little hearts. So they should have anything to dictate over, and they invented, they invented a group of questions to ask back in 2011, ah, are you addicted to or under the influence of ding, 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 Of course, enumerating cannabis listed as marijuana, the old um, propaganda, the old Harry Ainslinger term, because it's always been previously called, and the plant is known as cannabis, mm-hmm. Correct. Correct. So that also plays into the decision, um, which we are going through the process and will appeal if the next step of listening to, you know, presenting to X amount of judges, um, the writ of serratorari, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, I'm not up on my legal jargon, as my dad would say, to petition the Supreme Court. Um, One of the things that was not taken into full countenance in the decision was the historical nature of activism. Oh my goodness gracious, don't we know that Harry Ainslinger and that Nixon (laughs) tried to squelch political activism, activism of any form, with the drug war, now didn't they? Well, let me let me put just a little bit of historical perspective for our listeners here. Uh, you're absolutely correct uh, in, in talking about Harry Anslinger. And in fact, uh, what the federal government did in the late 30s in the outright uh, ban of uh, marijuana was eventually ruled unconstitutional uh, in that you had to have a tax stamp before you could grow or possess marijuana. But in, in applying for the tax stamp, you had to have the marijuana, which would put you in legal jeopardy. And so that was in the 1960s uh, overruled by the Supreme Court. And in 1968, uh, uh, the year that Nixon was elected, uh, Congress passed a federal gun control act. And one of the things that they said in that act was that users of various substances, including marijuana, uh, were prohibited from having uh, firearms. And so uh, that kind of set the ground for it. And then uh, where I broke into you there was roughly uh, where uh, Nixon had launched the war on drugs in 1972 following the uh, passage of the uh, Uniform Control Substances Act in 1971. So there is a, there's a long history of the federal government uh, really uh, sticking their nose into these issues, seeing it as a, a criminal justice uh, abuse issue as opposed to uh, personal health issues. Yes, versus personal health issue. But you, know, you and I, having been libertarians, choosing to identify still or not, you know, the intrusion of government into how many different places? Mm-hmm. <laughs> we, we've lost count. But Most notably, your body in the bedroom. Yes, yes. But you know, to go back and answer your question in another succinct way, um, this case and several others across the nation similarly, not always structured, this parallels the early birth control cases. Griswold v. Connecticut, mm-hmm. going up to Roe v. Wade, which some say was not the best case, um, nor necessarily, depending on your opinion, how it was decided, but it's still, we don't have bodily autonomy in this country, now do we? Not as much Period. as we think. Not at all. If I were to, <laughs> heaven forbid, come down with cancer tomorrow, um, <laughs> depending on what state I'm in and who would be paying for um uh, my treatments, be it Medicare, or Medicaid, or what have you, I would have to fight for my chosen treatment other than cut, poison, burn, mm-hmm. surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. Right. Why should the government have anything to do with that at all? Well, all, some, period, because some alone. people would say they're paying for it, but in fact, the choices that they do pay for there are typically much more expensive than alternatives we could look at. Precisely. Precisely. Let alone birth control. Let alone, um, you know, the cost of uh, bringing another human being into the world. And you know, again, the parallels of, and aren't we still fighting birth control? Which you know, abortion is not in my mind. Aren't we still fighting the birth control fights today in how many different states? So it's directly comparable. Absolutely. It's directly comparable.
So, um, you know, you, you also mentioned that, um, uh, that in this case about uh, having uh, uh, weapons for personal safety, here in Nevada, there's a part of the law that's uh, NRS 202.360, which is per unauthorized person in possession of a firearm, and it says that uh, anyone who's addicted to uh, a substance uh, is uh, therefore banned from having a firearm. And law enforcement in uh, here in southern Nevada, at least, and I imagine up there in northern Nevada when you were living there, uh, has the, the taken the view that if you are a medical marijuana patient, you are addicted to marijuana. Whether you're using it once a week, once a day, once a month, it doesn't matter. They consider you to be addicted, and they have used this on a local level uh, as a method of uh, not really preventing people from having firearms so much as charging them uh, with this violation uh, once they catch them with their marijuana. So it's it's a, a difficult situation. And then uh, you, as I uh, as I recall, um, went to challenge this situation uh, by having a, a card, uh, whether you were using it or not. And I think you were not, and you were just trying to make a point. Uh, and then trying to go and purchase a, a firearm here. In the state. Yes, and for full disclosure, I do maintain a residence in northern Nevada still to this day. You know, I that payment every month. <laughs> yep. I do more than think about but make. Um, the And I find this absolutely hilarious in the sense that, you know, gosh, the right hand of the government doesn't know what the left hand is doing because after, after um, I was turned down for this purchase by not not selecting to answer the question. I left that blank. Mm -hmm. I left that blank on the form, okay? Political activism, freedom of the First Amendment of free speech. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we can take all the vitamins and herbs and things that are prohibited now by the U.S. FDA, but you can get out of Canada, yeah. you can get out of Europe by calling it free speech. Why wouldn't that be interesting? Um, so... <laughs> By choosing to do that, going back, um, later I obtained my concealed carry weapon permit in Nevada. I renewed it. And also obtained it in Utah, which has reciprocity in 30 states. Mm -hmm. So the government's still trying to say, wait a minute, you're a dangerous criminal by doing or not doing some kind of substance. Yet it's a much longer background check to get a concealed carry weapon permit in 30 states. My goodness gracious, how hypocritical. <laughs> and the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Hmm. And how unsurprising. But if they did, I think our liberties would be further eroded than they already are. And on a different note, I've had no problems uh, getting my hunting tags or any of those waterfowl stamps, mm. you know, uh, migrant bird stamps or any of that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? They've never denied me and said, oh, you know, we know you're a medical marijuana patient, but yet you're going to go march off into the woods with your guns. They don't seem to mind taking my money for that. But yeah, when I also went to uh, renew my concealed weapons permit after I got denied for the purchase of a firearm myself, they denied me my renewal on my concealed weapons mm. permit eventually. Which uh, why I which is why I took such a which, such a close interest in your case. I have kind of mm. a, a question on Thank topic you. with that. I was wondering whether, since the Ninth Circuit in its infinite wisdom chose to uh, deny us our constitutional rights, whether you were planning on appealing this to the United States Supreme Court, or whether your lawyer thinks you might have a chance of having it heard, because you know they're kind of fickle. They can either choose to or not choose to hear it, regardless of your passion for the topic. So, what well, do you they, feel they, that your your chances yes, are in actually yes, getting it heard? If I may interject at the beginning of, of the conversation, I stated our next step is to go before another panel. I want to say it's au bon pas, but that's not the proper legal term, um, to appeal in that route. And then if it is turned down from there, then we um, petition the Supreme Court. And right. that, frankly, has been the plan all along. That and, and there this, was, you know, how do we see this through? How do we see this through? And this was a, a three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit. So for, first, what you're doing is you're appealing into the um, uh, into the full Ninth Circuit before proceeding with cert and and uh, with the Supreme Court. And it's not only a case of do they want to hear this or not, because they do get to pick and choose. But the Supreme Court these days gets over 5,000 petitions every year for cases Correct. to be heard and they only uh, give cert uh, to uh, less than a hundred and and the oh number my. of cases that the Supreme Court uh, has been hearing has been steadily trending down over the decades and uh, so uh, even if you have a good case uh, 
that doesn't mean the Supreme Court is going to take it. But before we even got to the Supreme Court, did you file, was this case heard locally in Nevada? Yes, back in 2012. In fact, that was the last time that I was in Nevada and appeared in court in December of 2012. And the judge dismissed it. You can go back and read all of that on the internet, as well as the source documents against source documents. Um, so it was dismissed at that time, citing um, a legitimate dr- violent drug dealer. Uh, I forget what the particular case was. So it was not Judge Navarro, I believe her name was. Um, how in the world it was applied to my case, I don't know. I sincerely hope that this goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, but my, you know, I pray every night, Mike, for the freedom of patience and people. You know, why should we have to ask permission to have control over our health care? It's so it's nice to hear that you were uh, directly directly correlated to a violent drug dealer in her in her. Yeah. Uh, in her deposition that that must have felt really that made you feel all warm and fuzzy inside being a law-abiding citizen there but uh besides that i noticed that in their in their decision the three the three to nothing decision by this panel uh it was stated that uh the drugs can quote (laughs) raise the risk of irrational or unpredictable behavior which gun use should not be associated which of course is is complete nonsense i don't even know where these people kind of get some of these these ideas it doesn't seem as though there was much much science put or thought process put into the decision and that their pre-existing uh their pre-existing i guess i would call it mania kind of took hold with the uh the language the language that would use that was used in their decision my other main gripe with this is that they said that oh you know it's federally illegal everyone always says that it's federally illegal but how can it be so how can medical cannabis be so federally illegal when that when our same united states government currently uh still operates a medical cannabis distribution program to a very select few patients that was a result of a supreme court case back in the 70s i believe late 70s and it, it, it's just the the hip you know they hold a patent on the plant people are starting to toss that around more in social media circles but really uh, it's been i don't want to say common knowledge but it's been public knowledge for decades about this and so when they when these federal judges throw this in people's faces it seems that they're just willingly and almost maliciously ignoring their own government's findings ah, on but this. maliciously there we are going back to part of the decision of this case if i may interject please political activism we want to squelch they want to squelch any and all political activism and free speech. Now, don't they? Yes, they how many <laughs> How many historical precedents do we have for that? Plenty. And my own, in, in my own personal existence. Oh, so, yeah, yes. I was there when it happened. Yeah. Uh, almost got caught, I almost got arrested yeah. myself that day. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we, we agree uh, with you that, that they, uh, they do try to um, uh, tamp down on the dissent as much as they possibly can. So we need to take a, a real quick break here, uh, Rowan, uh, for a commercial break. We'll be right back and uh, talk a little bit more about this. Thank you. Nevada Pure is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, and a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Did you know that your medicine could contain pesticides, heavy metals, and even mold? Are you really sure that you're getting the same potency every single time? Well, the answer to that question is simple. Digipath Labs. Digipath Labs is a state-approved laboratory run by scientists. So look for the Digipath Labs quality seal on your next medicine and on the door of your favorite dispensary. To learn more, go to digipathlabs.com. That's D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. 
And welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour with our special guest today, Rowan Wilson, uh, who's uh, discussing uh, the recent Ninth Circuit decision, uh, which limits our rights. I don't want to say our sovereign rights, but limits our human rights, really, to uh, to both treat our illnesses and uh, and defend ourselves. Um, so. Rowan, where where do you where do you see this case going in a broader sense? And I know we we know that you're you're going to appeal to the to the full Ninth Circuit and then uh, to the to the Supreme Court if necessary. Um, your attorney uh, Chaz Rainey has said that if um, uh, if the court does this, it's kind of like a camel's nose under the tent. And if they can stop one brand of of uh, medicine users uh, from obtaining guns, that they could extend that into people who are taking um, Lortabs or Hydrocodones or Xanax or, or Whatever this the and that, and, and then take that to alcohol. And, and obviously that is not in the ruling anywhere, but if you have activist versus original judges and you're, you have the Ninth Circuit being the most liberal leaning uh, in the country, uh, do you see a danger that the, they could use this ruling to uh, further limit gun ownership in the country. I think they're going to use it to limit all kinds of things. My hope and my daily thought process doing this is the hope that, however, be it this case, be it other cases, again, we go back to absolute freedom for patients and people. I should be able to have full bodily autonomy. I any parent, any person should be able to choose what they wish to put in their body for medical treatment, preferably, for health and wellness benefits, preferably, or other. You know, I should not have to order, as I have for years, vitamins and minerals to benefit my body out of Canada through Europe because the FDA is limiting, limiting <laughs> what we are able to obtain. And gentlemen, perhaps you remember or you don't that a few years ago, Diamond Foods received a letter from the FDA. Please verify this as well out there. It's a public document. Um, the FDA tried to say that walnuts, walnuts are a drug. Oh my gosh, we have to limit walnuts. Mm. And there was public outcry. And it was squelched. So how do we bring about a conversation to look at the bigger picture to, and they see the money in this, you know, here standing in Washington state today, the last time I looked at the Liquor and Control Board weekly marijuana numbers, as they call it, we were up to $4.2 million a day, a day in sales. How much tax is that? They've essentially thrown the patients under the bus here by closing all the dispensaries and then, oh, gee, sales at the recreational shops where you can't obtain proper tested pesticide free medicine, let alone unadulterated oil largely and that actually that, free. you know Rowan that actually ties into another article that I have here uh, about Colorado uh, med Colorado marijuana sales in general the figures topped a hundred and twenty two million dollars mm -hmm. just in the month of July that's that's a, a 27 percent increase from the year before and you're absolutely right to point out tax revenues uh, and and how much that can be used for school systems uh, for substance abuse treatment programs and any other n number of needs that that we the people legitimately have you know, it seems as though the government can move as fast as it wants to when it wants to um, we've been fighting this battle to very slowly unwind what happened and I'm not exactly sure how long it took for that plan to kind of illegalize marijuana back in the 20s or 30s to kind of materialize. But uh, we've been trying to undo that damage for the past 70, 80 years now and forcefully for the last 45, maybe 50. Um, it's, and uh, we've made very limited progress on a federal level. Yet I saw on CNN recently that this, uh, this, this drug that they're selling at, at smoke shops and... Uh, at the champ shows called Cracktome or Kratom, oh, Kratom, or yeah. Kratom yeah, has all of a sudden, overnight, with the snap of a finger, become a Schedule One drug. Mm -hmm. 
when it was just unregulated all of a sudden all of a sudden it's this huge public you know problem and you know I, I always thought that spice was pretty dangerous because it seems like the effects are pretty obvious the news is reporting these deaths and things like that but I had never really heard that this kratom or whatever mm -hmm. you call I had never really heard anything about it oh yeah it'll do this and that for you but uh, I never heard that it was causing mass death or causing emergency room visits or something like that or anything that would potentially necessitate a schedule one uh, designation all of a sudden but here we are and here it is well it, so, it becomes oh, an enforcement but, but if I may offer let's Please. also tie this back historically to you know what I was doing post MBA and towards my osteopathic medical school uh, prep the American Medical Association took over in the 1930s and not that there were <laughs> all angels operating in what was then the naturopathic homeopathic movement or the osteopathic movement or the snake oil is, movement right oh yeah but it is when essentially they started regulating any and all of the natural <laughs> treatments that had been used for hundreds of years in this country, thousands of years across the world. You know, when I was singing, my first career was opera, and I was singing in Austria, and you had to go see a physician, we would sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and I would be treated with herbs, vitamins, and tinctures, commonly, by an MD. We don't have that in this country now going back to the 1930s. So you see the patterns again. It's not just regulating, putting you know, something new in a Schedule One drug. Um, and it's not going to change when marijuana is probably likely cannabis is put in a Schedule Two or below. It goes to control now, doesn't it? It goes to control. Therefore, back to the bodily autonomy, the bodily autonomy argument. We should be able to do whatever we want <laughs> health and wellness wise medical treatment wise with our bodies Again, well that's that, that's the old libertarian line that uh, we should be able to do wi what we want with our bodies but our my right to do what I want with my fist ends an inch away from your nose and so as long as I am not affecting you and impacting you in a negative fashion uh, yes we should all have complete domain over our bodies our lives Absolutely. if we don't have control of that what do we have control of for Christ's sake yeah, we're still um, slaves. but still uh, you know you were saying oh you know we don't have doctors that treat with tinctures anymore but I've noticed in the past maybe two or three years the reemergence of what's called natural nat naturopaths mm -hmm. that are kind of like natural holistic based doctors that are pretty well educated most of them I've met uh, and are trying to kind of refocus their practice on you know uh, just living a, a healthier lifestyle and kind of being a better you know steward oh, of the earth it, and things it's like much that, more rather, than that rather than, uh, rather than kind of taking all those drugs you know and things like that but my, my, my cousin recommended that I go to one for a for a, a vertigo problem I had and and uh, the doctor was able to guide me very, very quickly and give me some basic lifestyle changes without giving me any over the, you know, without any prescription medicine, just give me some basic health advice, just like, look, you know, this is what you need to do to get your stuff together. And, and the results have been quite dramatic. Which is what your doctor should be doing. You were going to expand on that, Rowan? Sorry. <laughs> yes, the prerequisites, you know, thank you for mentioning that. Naturopaths are wonderful. The same prerequisites, in case you didn't know, for naturopathic medical school are the same, are the same as for osteopathy or a regular medical doctor. I was MD. not aware. Okay. Same. Some of these same studies at medical school for OD, um, or excuse me, DO, osteopathy, ND, naturopathy, and MD are similar. You have the structure of the body. You know, you can compare across the board. Again, easily Google on the Internet to see what the actual courses are. Um, we've had for hundreds of years treatments that are naturopathic rather than, again, back to the 1930s, AMA, less than 12% of all physicians belong to the American Medical Association, mm. throw us under the bus saying, oh, you can't take apple cider vinegar three times a day to cure your stomach acid or treat it. You know, oh, you need to take this pill. Allopathic medicine came in yeah. and took over. We've had 70 years of allopathic medicine. And it works really well for acute care. You know, if I'm bleeding on the side of the road, take me into the hospital, stitch me up, give me some drugs. But if I come down with a chronic, a chronic problem, like wouldn't you agree that there are a number of people taking cannabis with chronic problems? 
Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Not even as a pun, but seriously, you know, um, uh, it's funny you had mentioned stomach acid. I had a serious stomach acid problem. I was taking over the counter medicines premised for it and was able to cure it with homeopathic remedies just by changing my diet over the course of a few mm -hmm. months. But I, I, I kind of want to uh, shift focus on something. Sorry to kind of jump around, but. Uh, I was reading on the National Rifle Association's Facebook page. They were covering your story. I mean, your your story about this federal ban on marijuana card holders has, of course, gone national. There have been a, there's been a lot of coverage over it, but like you said, unfortunately, none of them seem to quote you directly. So um, I was reading the article <laughs> on CNN, and and uh, they were talking. Thank you for mentioning uh, all this. Me, yes. not, not CNN <laughs> on the National Rifle Association website. I'm sorry. And they were just kind of covering it very broadly. And I commented, and I'm just like, I wonder why they haven't really weighed in directly on it. They just kind of copied and pasted like an Associated Press uh, article about it. They didn't have their own journalists go through and kind of give their their view of what they thought about it and I commented under it I'm like why doesn't your organization take a stance on these constitutional rights that are being taken away from a disproportionately large amount of you know law abiding citizens and these people these people I couldn't believe for such a libertarian oh. page how statist the responses were oh, yeah. they were just like oh well it's federally legal so that's that and shut you down and you dopers that's it and I'm just like wait a minute like shouldn't isn't the the purpose of this page to protect rights and kind of come together and work through these issues and try to work on ways to change the law not just bend over oh, the government says bend over so let's bend over you know that doesn't sound well, very as, NRA to me as far back as this 1968 gun control act the NRA was supporting the prevention of uh, drug users marijuana users from obtaining weapons the, so. the, yeah but the perception is so different now and even on the Republican side you know uh, there are so many people that are afraid to come out of the cannabis closet because of its perceived as you know you're you're a bad person or you're not a real Republican or whatever which of course you know a lot of the more conservative people are uh, affiliated with the National Rifle Association so you know I, I'm just trying to figure out how to get more of the national uh, the national powerhouse of gun rights into this very very critical issue because like you were saying Mike uh, if you allow them to kind of crack this door or put the camel's nose under the tent as you said where does this stop and why aren't these people who are supposedly uh, here to protect our gun rights so willingly ignoring this potential fatal not fatal but a serious erosion or potential erosion and, of and our rights I, is it purely a conservative versus liberal thing well let me let me ask you a, a, about a twist on that Rowan when you got involved in this I mean, because you're talking about our, our rights over our bodies our rights to to uh, take the medicines or, or, or herbal cures that, that will help us but at the same time I know you feel very strong about the Constitution the whole Constitution and um, your Second Amendment rights of, of obtaining firearms, uh, how much of, of uh, your getting into this fight was a result of, of that? And what are your views on not only uh, uh, you know, what we take internally, but what we can do to protect ourselves and families? Oh, I'll challenge succinct. Number one, going back a bit to the other gentleman's statement, the NRA has bargained away our rights for years. I have not mm -hmm. renewed my NRA membership for years. GOA is a much gun owners of America and Jews for the preservation of firearms. Hello, if That's we would have one. had firearms, hello, we Jews, would there be a lot more of us still in Europe today? But I digress. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was not a gun owner and a gun fan until I lived in Oakland in a very nice section of town on Lake Merritt next to the multi million dollar high rises in an older apartment building. And there was a serious hard drug dealer on the first floor. We kept reporting. We kept trying to, you know, you'd hear knocks on the door and all kinds of screaming on the common entranceway at all hours. And that they seemingly didn't care until the day there was gunfire, was working from home. Boy, they came. Boy, they came. And I decided I needed to, you know, have something to be able to protect myself in the crazy state of California, stand, as we now call it. And when you're saying they came, you mean the police? The police. Yes. Oh, yeah, they came and got him and found all kinds of things on him. Couldn't evict him for a year because of the laws of Oakland and what have you. But it was, hey, this is me alone on a weekday working from home. And I'm hearing boom, 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 boom. Oh, my gosh. What's going on? I need to protect myself. My yeah, knife, no my mace, the rest is not going to protect me. So fast forward. 
to 2011, living in northern Nevada, trying to open a cannabis dispensary a mm-hmm. mile and a half from the Bunny Ranch mm-hmm. in Dayton, Nevada. And who is my, you know, my second trip to Six Figures and back was in real estate. So I met, um, you know, was stopping in boots on the ground, this little vacant space in a nice strip mall, which had, according to NDOT, Something like 32,000 people coming by in a week. Great traffic! Great traffic We're on the turn off of Virginia City. Well, who owned the building? Fred and Fred's Custom Firearms. We shared a wall. <laughs> that's who I tried to buy the gun from. So that's why I was known I and mm-hmm. left the mm-hmm. checkbox blank, blank. And this is all in the deposition. Again, if people were to look at source material, it's all out there. It's all out there. Go back to the source documents. And to from do that, 2011. let me just ask uh, Rowan to do that, uh, what case would they look up? What's the actual name of the case? It started as Wilson v. Holder. Mm-hmm. It was because Eric Holder was then right. the, the attorney, attorney general. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now it is Wilson v. Lynch mm-hmm. refiled. Okay. Hmm. So, so I believe if you go into Juicy enough, and okay. I, you know, not compensated and I haven't looked in any of the original, it's been, it's been five years. Mm-hmm. But it's all there. This must have been it's wildly expensive for you to pursue all the way through to the Supreme Court like this. You've taken it upon yourself to... Uh, well, to the circuit court at this point. Yeah, to really, so. you know, I mean, I have to applaud you for this. I, I, I want to call it well, a Well, no, God bless the ACLU of Northern Nevada. And boy, if anybody wants to get in conspiracy theories and, you know, Jews, hey, you know, if really there were a Jewish banking conspiracy, hey, where's our checks? Where's our checks? Huh. Chaz Rainey and Rainey yeah. could certainly use it right now in his yeah. firm. Go donate. Yeah, it was <laughs> a pro bono case. That he- That's amazing. <laughs> yep. like, uh, yeah. What an amazing work of philanthropy by both of you. Thank you. Thank you both for, for standing up so publicly for our rights. You know, so few people are willing to really put their money where their mouth is or put the time where their mouth is because they always say the most important thing you can give someone is your time and you certainly both of you have taken enough of it out of your own lives to pursue this at great risk to yourself so thank you well and michael and yourself i mean what are we if we are not to stand up you know did, what We're is the quote slaves. by thomas jefferson yeah. that we must be ever vigilant mm-hmm. liberty requires ever vigilance yeah well <laughs> That's very true. You know, I, I want to get back to a point that you uh, were making earlier when we were talking about the AMA and the the allopathic model, since you have training and experience in this area. Um, it, it certainly, uh, we're all aware of uh, Eastern medicine, uh, specifically in this case, uh, Chinese medicine, which has been practiced for the better part of 5,000 years, and yet the AMA thinks that um, Chinese herbal treatments, uh, acupuncture and the like are boogeyman science, and that uh, this whole huge body of work, which predates Western civilization, is just, eh, that's not worth paying attention to. If that's such nonsense, then why is the placebo uh, argument so commonly administered in Western medicine, purposefully giving people nothing and hoping that they have results in order to use your mind to over you know like if that isn't using eastern style you know or uh uh well, they're doing it to test the least. efficacy of, of drugs uh, in, in a case where they're doing studies. Well, sure. You, that, know. you know, I mean, sure, we could say that, but uh, I, I don't understand why it can't be both. You know, wh- why does it have to be such one or the other? Well, that, that's a good question. What do you think, Rowan? Wh- why? Ah, uh, gentlemen, you know profit motive in big pharma. That's what there I was you, thinking. There you go, yeah. How, uh, you know, let, let's paint it plain. Yeah. You know, not that all drugs are bad, all prescription drugs are bad. No. You know, we still have aspirin. We still have various different things that, again, but much better for acute care, Mm -hmm. acute care than chronic long-term care. And as I still say to people who ask me for health advice, it's, hey, nothing is going to work. Cannabis oil to vitamin C drip um, to get rid of your cancer if you're still sitting on your butt and you're eating crap, (laughs) right? There's no magic pill. You know, my mother's wanted to take a magic pill and be a size six for years. Doesn't work that way doesn't work that way it's one part of the picture so having you know a healthy lifestyle exercising the body not necessarily vigorously but even walking around the block having a healthy outlook and then putting it with natural oils if I, if I can, with natural treatments if i can say 
what you just said, I think, in, in somewhat different words, you know, and considering that the pharmaceutical lobby is the largest lobbying group in Congress, and wow. they also have quite a quite a pull in in state legislature legislatures, the the pharmaceutical industry does not profit from having a nation full of healthy people. Mm -hmm. The pharmaceutical industry makes their money from having people treated with chronic conditions and and coming up with new conditions all the time and saying oh you got to mm -hmm. try this you got to try that and if we were all healthy and we all ate right and exercised uh, okay that may be a little pipe dream but you know if we were a healthier nation that would be not to the benefit of the pharmaceutical industry the indoctrination starts at youth when they give kids that have outrageous amounts of sugar in their diet ADHD pills because yeah. they don't even look at you know what i mean mm -hmm. not once when I was growing up, did any of the doctors who were screening any of the kids in my class for ADHD say, okay, well, what are you feeding your son or daughter in the morning before they come to school? What does your diet consist of? What is their physical activity level? All they do is go, well, he's got problems at school, give him Ritalin. And yeah. then when you grow up, taking these, these drugs doesn't really seem like a big deal because you've been broken into that from from youth so it is what it is and uh, we in even here in nevada have struggled with uh, big pharma kind of sticking their nose in the marijuana legalization mm -hmm. movement mm -hmm. they were fortunately unsuccessful in killing our 2013 senate bill 374 for the uh medical dispensary legalization pass or passage mm -hmm. but hell you know they sure they sure gave it the old college try. They, they tried. We, <laughs> we beat them by, by only one vote, and by that was by you know Michelle Fiore crossing Michelle. crossing lines and, yeah. uh, and voting with the the majority. And Peggy coming off of her deathbed. Peggy to Pierce coming coming off of her deathbed to vote for it as well. Let me yeah. ask you about something else, uh, Rowan. That, that's directly tied to what we're talking about right now. Um, according to the campaign finance reports posted online by the Arizona Secretary of State's mm -hmm. office, uh, the fentanyl manufacturer Incest Therapeutics has donated five hundred thousand dollars to the foes of their prop 205 marijuana legalization effort how surprised are you that big farm <laughs> is <laughs> not at all not at all given how the patients in the state of washington have been thrown under their bus you know ann rivers one of the state senators up here who's up for re-election um has received and this is all in open secrets um it's all viewable online merck and the other big drug companies merck in the last, I believe, when I looked it up, three to five years, has spent $40 million in political donations. Mm -hmm. Senator Rivers authored the, what a, what a name, <laughs> the <laughs> Patient Protection Act. Usually when they which, do those things, it means exactly the opposite no of what they Precisely. Name. Precisely. So at what point do we reach an outcry in this country that people cannot afford the drugs. They cannot afford their premiums. Mm -hmm. They cannot afford the pills. They don't want to be taking the pills when they're fed up and they've had enough. And also, oh, you, no. you're talking about paying premiums. There's, there's roughly every 30 seconds, there's a health-related bankruptcy in the United States. It That's is by insane. far the largest cause of personal bankruptcy in the United States. That's horrible. You know, I'm a, uh, that's something I, w I will get behind when, uh, when Obama was trying to push Obamacare. Mm -hmm. Right at first, he came out with the speech, and I, th I think it's been kind of a mess the way it's been rolled out. But he gave the speech, and he said, no one should go bankrupt from getting sick in the greatest country in the world and I said you're I, damn right no I one should go that. be bankrupt and it hasn't exactly worked out that way we're still kind of chewing through it but uh, you know damn it he had a point there and that is just absolutely criminal to have people going broke after working their whole lives because of uh, an illness that was not their fault you know so I mean some people have uh, diseases that they acquired by you know you get cirrhosis of the liver because you drank too mm -hmm. much or something but some people just wake up one day and have a brain tumor and you get screwed how the hell do you you know deny them i had to have know. a quad bypass because i chose the wrong parents yeah no kidding apparently i have high cholesterol levels you know these have you know rowan i know we're keeping you longer than we Killing had me. planned uh can you stick around with us for a couple more minutes and we, we wrap up we're going to go to a break and uh love to talk to you a little bit more Thank you. I am able to do that. Thank you, gentlemen. That's Thank great, you. and we'll be right back. Hi. 
I'm Armin Yemenijan, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. Getting Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting Legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999. That's 702-979-9999. Or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. And we're back with the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with our special guest, S. Rowan Wilson, uh, who is the plaintiff in a, a case which sounds like it's going to go to the Supreme Court. So um, how, how is this um, protracted struggle? And, you know, it, it goes on for years, but it, seems it, it goes on in little spurts here and there. How, how has this affected you personally, Rowan? Recently, in the last few weeks, because of all of the press, I have been shocked at the few, few, again, as earlier in the conversation, few journalists, writers, what have you, that have contacted me. Mm-hmm. I have, and, you know, through MaryJanesWorld.com and various other things, I can be found. Mm-hmm. So that's been shocking. It's been a lesson in press. Uh, but life still goes on. You know, I worked startup and then back at a day job. Mm-hmm. And being able to dart out of the office and take a phone call. But I'm also in a legal state. You know, my concerns truly are more for the people who've had to move out of Washington into Oregon mm-hmm. to be able to grow plants, more than four. Well, because you were talking them. about the Patient Protection Act, and we kind of oh, yeah. cut you at that. So, so how is that affecting people up there? They're moving. They're really? moving. And, and what, is, uh, what is the heart of the children. act? The heart of the act was t- attempting to combine very poorly, very poorly, the medical system with the uh, recreational system. Calif- mm, Oregon probably has the best example of the two. I'm not as familiar with Alaska. I haven't been to Alaska in several years. And Colorado is probably the second best example. You know, as legalization happens as medical cannabis happens in other states in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. We're going to have 50 different little laboratories of how this is to be done. Washington is not a model to follow. Not at all. Patients now can only because of this Protection Act. (laughs) And we know the Liquor Control Board is incredibly um, you know, we've asked for public records and people have sued them and have not been able to, you know, with out-of-court settlements They've not been able to speak about what they found of the behind the door closed meetings, with payoffs of you know felons getting um, you know outright criminals, violent criminals, not cannabis criminals, mm-hmm. getting licenses. So patients are moving out of state because now they're only allowed to grow four plants. They must go on an incredibly onerous registry again, back to <laughs> HIPAA compliance. You know, it's and it really goes back to the rights of, of real property owners, which is which was the basis of the American Revolution and uh, the basis of the Constitution to protect the rights of property owners. And oh, so, it's the illusion uh, of ownership in this country. You well, never really own property. Yeah, you know, I own my property. I don't really own it. If I don't pay my my sore bill for for three months, there's a lien on my goddamn house, mm-hmm. which I recently discovered. <clears throat> Ouch. It just pay, you know, pay you, it before you, they auction yeah, it Yeah, you, you clear it up, but still, it's just like, you know, you go through and you're like, wow, I got this paid off house, and like, this, it, is, it, like this is it, you know, I got it made, and nope, 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 you got to pay your property tax, you got to pay this, got to pay that, and so, of course, you go searching for these things, well, at least I don't have a homeowner's association or, yeah. or something like that, and you try to, you know, justify it in your mind the best you can, but it is agitating, to put it mildly. 
you well, know. in the 1930s, some of the first revolts were property tax revolts, people not paying them. I don't even so believe that I own mineral rights, or I know we don't have water rights. We don't have air rights. Don't, uh, don't, have, don't have mineral rights in most of Nevada. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, you were saying going back to the 1930s and the, the tax revolts? Oh, yes. The tax revolts after you know, the 1929 Great Crash, mm -hmm. people decided to not pay their property taxes to force the government into doing various different things. You know, and back to my overall question, gentlemen, how does this change with cannabis? At what point is the tipping point for health in the United States? At what point is the tipping point for cannabis? You know, this case is but one of many, one of many citizen activists. You know, it, it's so much bigger than simply, oh, we're pushing back against EpiPen and these opioid epidemic. You know, we're talking about bodily autonomy Again, at what when do we hit this tipping point? I don't and know. I, I think you've got a, a good point there uh, in, in the tipping point and all these uh, uh, these other factors that you're mentioning. But it becomes as we talk about these things and as we make these fights, it becomes less and less about cannabis and more about personal liberty. Precisely. So it's just um, it, it's something that. Um, uh, that I don't see being fixed in my lifetime and you know we've been striving for over 200 years to create a more perfect union and unfortunately uh, it seems we have gone seriously astray um, and and I'm gonna go to the ruling of Citizens United when when they're mm -hmm. when the Supreme Court is saying that corporations are people and they can they have all the exact same rights as people um, I just don't buy it and I think that's a, a another major point that uh, works against the actual living people in the United States. So just just my, my two cents on that. So anyway, Rowan, I, I want to thank you so much for, for taking this time with us um, uh, out of your busy working day. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we have gone to the source on this. And I think that um, uh, the fight you're fighting is so important, and it's not just for people who smoke pot, and it's not just for patients, but as I'm just saying, it's, it's for all of us. It's, it, these it are really about is. the liberties and the, and the rights that we have. And Rowan, i got to salute you for this, because not a whole lot of people would, would actually have the gumption to stand up and make this kind of fight. Well, no one has until you. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you for contacting me um, and for contacting Jazz and for verifying source material. What you do, I mean, we're all in this fight together. Not entirely a populist thing, but it, you know, when we all reach and we push this tipping point, mm -hmm. we push this tipping point. And hasn't that been how things have historically changed in this country, let alone around the world? And and the failure to to uh, achieve that that motivation that to to you know, fight back when, when things are being tipped in the other direction. You were mentioning just a little bit earlier that, um, uh, that, you know, had the Jews had more guns in Europe in the 1930s, the results would have been different. And what what happened there uh, was a population who, as bad as things were and, and getting steadily worse, they couldn't believe that it could possibly get any worse or that it could possibly get any more authoritarian. And so they largely did nothing and un sadly found out that, yeah, it can get a lot worse. And so, yeah. uh, yeah. you know. The, but we saw it coming for a long time, mm -hmm. as we have. In this country, you know, my Jewish relatives of the Ashkenazi Europeans started leaving in the 1880s and came over to the United States. Mm -hmm. So, you yeah, know, what do we see happening and how many people are renouncing their citizenship I was going to say, but, uh, but where do we run to? Yeah, because we're seeing uh, the, the very dangerous uh, rise of, uh, of racist and nationalist movements who, mm -hmm. are, who are having uh, a, a newfound legitimacy, they claim, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in the political process these days. And it's just a scary thing to watch. And, you know, if, if, we, don't, uh, if we don't learn from Stand history... Stand up and push back. Yeah, Absolutely. we're doomed to repeat it. With, Within peaceful means. Well, oh, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're not talking about Second Amendment watching. remedies. Yeah. You know, we're, we're the great democratic Experiment. Uh, example, yeah. aren't we? Yes, experiment precisely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're about out of time. So, Rowan, once again, thank you so much for visiting with us for this past thank hour. You. And, um, wow, it is such important work you're doing. So uh, we hope to check in with you uh, uh, on the next stage of this process. And Can't hopefully it, it goes. it's going to be victorious. Thank you, gentlemen. Enjoy your time. 
um, and keep spreading the good word. Yep. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. And Bye-bye. that's just about wrapping it up for the uh, Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour this week. We thank our special guest, Rowan Wilson, not only for speaking with us today, for but for being an activist uh, for patient rights and for American rights. Absolutely. That's... Uh it's our civic duty to attempt to undo bad laws as we see fit and attempt to make the positive change for the rest of our citizenry. And we have pages of news that we didn't get to because we, um, uh, because we wanted to, uh, to talk about these very important issues. And uh, join us again next week. We'll give you the, the latest news, what's going on, and uh, uh, maybe what you can do to, to fight for, uh, for our rights uh, as we get closer to the November election. Right. Register to vote before October. Great. Absolutely. Register to vote. We don't care who you vote for. Uh, we're a nonprofit, but we do want you to vote. So um, right. thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Right.